I have a friend that's been studying the art of electronics and was puzzled by this emitter follower circuit and why it clipped at minus 5 volts. Rather than answer that question directly, I decided this was a good excuse to do a good back to basics video on the emitter follower. Let's get started. So here's the simplest form of an emitter follower or a common collector or amplifier. Simply we take the input uh, to the base of the transistor, the output from the emitter, and then the collector is common effectively to the supply. Now the features and characteristics of the emitter follower amplifier is that it has a high input impedance, meaning that it won't load down the source that it's connected to. It also has a low output impedance, which means it can drive heavy loads or low impedance loads. And it also has unity voltage gain. Therefore, it's mainly used as a buffer uh, to drive low impedance loads or to isolate one stage from another so that uh, the performance of one stage doesn't affect the performance of the stage preceding it. So let's take a look at how the emitter follower works. So again, here's our very simple circuit. As long as the input voltage, so the voltage at the base, is high enough to turn the transistor on, the emitter follower works. And that, in fact, that's one of the operational conditions. It only works when the transistor is biased on. So in this case, the input voltage has to be at least, so we'll say, six tenths of a volt or so above the emitter. So once the transistor is on, uh, then you essentially get collector current that will flow through the transistor and into the emitter resistor. The voltage across the emitter resistor is really going to be set by the base voltage, because it's the base voltage minus effectively VBE, or one diode drop. That determines the voltage across the emitter. In fact, the emitter follower works like a diode drop level shifter, except with some extra current help. So again, uh, as the, this voltage raises up, this voltage kind of follows it, minus one VBE. So the output voltage follows the input, but shifted down by one base emitter drop, or one diode drop. So with the transistor biased on, there's some small base current flowing. The collector current is equal to beta times that base current, so that's the amount of collector current. And the sum of those two flow out of the emitter and therefore down through RE or shared by RE and whatever is connected to the output. Now of course for say an NPN emitter follower like this, this will only work if the emitter sources current. Right? If something happens at the load, that uh, asks the emitter follower to sync some current, uh, it can't do that. So the operational conditions are that it only works when the transistor is biased on, and that the emitter in this case is sourcing current. So here's our test circuit to show the basic operation. Here's our emitter follower, just a general purpose NPN transistor, just about any NPN transistor will work for this, using a 1K emitter resistor and a 9 volt power supply. The function generator I'm using allows me to control both the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of the sinusoidal signal as well as the DC offset of that signal. So it can be set to swing around ground or the whole thing be shifted up or down uh, above or below ground. Channel 1 is connected to the input signal that's attached to the base or effectively the output of the function generator. Channel 2 is connected across the emitter resistor to show the output of the emitter follower. Let's take a look. Here it is on the breadboard collector connected up to my 9 volt supply. The red line is bringing in the signal from my function generator. The emitter has got a 1K resistor going to ground, and the probe here is going off to channel 2 on the scope. Channel 1 is going to show the function generator output. So we can see my 1 volt peak to peak sinusoidal signal at 1 kilohertz. Uh, that's the yellow trace here. And then the blue trace is channel 2 is the output of the emitter follower. Now right now, we can see my ground reference is over here. So my one volt peak to peak signal is essentially centered around ground. So the only way it's forward biasing or trying to forward bias the transistor is during the positive swing, but it's only going up to you know, 0.5 volts, which is not quite enough to turn the transistor on. So we see just a little bit of uh, wiggle, just barely at the output. Now as I increase the DC offset and bring it positive, we can now see what's starting to happen. Uh, my signal is now swinging above ground, so now I'm getting high enough to turn the emitter follower on, basically turn on the base emitter junction, and now this voltage is beginning to follow the input. The larger I make that DC offset, the more it follows. And we can actually see as we bring this up, at about a half a volt per division, we could see that there's about six tenths of a volt between the input and the output. And that's why we call this an emitter follower. The, the emitter simply follows what the input is doing. 
as long as the transistor stays biased and the output can always source current. Let's take a little closer look at the input and output impedance of the emitter follower. Now let's start with the input impedance. So really the question is how much does the input current change? What's my delta IB for a change in input voltage? That's kind of our definition of the input impedance. Let's start with a few approximations to help make the math easier. We know that the emitter current is equal to beta plus 1 times IB, right? Because it's IB plus beta IB, is, so we get beta plus 1 IB. But beta is typically 100 or more, sometimes 200 or more. So it's a pretty decent approximation to just ignore the plus 1 and just say that the emitter current is approximately equal to beta times IB. Now remember we said the emitter follower is unity gain, right? It's basically just a diode drop or diode drop level shifter with some current help. So the output voltage uh, is simply equal to the input minus VBE. So therefore any change in the output is directly the result of the exact same amount of change in the input. So 100 millivolt change in the input gives you a 100 millivolt change in the output. The input uh, voltage change results in a change in IE, okay? in the emitter current because it's causing a change at the output voltage and therefore the amount of change in the base current is equal to IE divided by beta. So we can already see that a change in the uh, input voltage results in a larger change in the emitter current than you will see in the base current. In fact, beta times larger. So the input impedance can be defined as the change in input voltage divided by the resulting change of input base current. Now we know that the delta IB can be replaced by delta IE divided by beta. Okay, so we know that's equivalent. So we can simplify that and say, okay, beta times the delta VN uh, divided by the delta IE is all equivalent. And, that, and VN divided by IE is going to be equal to RE. Well, in fact, RE in parallel with the load. So we can see that Zn is effectively equal to beta times the emitter resistor or the emitter resistor in parallel with whatever output is connected at the load. So in other words, quite simply stated, the input impedance is equal to beta times whatever the load is at the emitter. So it makes the input impedance look 100 or 200 times larger than the load you're trying to drive. That's one of the big advantages of the emitter follower. Now let's look at the output impedance. So this, the output impedance is the impedance looking into the output of the emitter follower. So it effectively is RE in parallel with a couple of things. So it's in parallel with the intrinsic emitter resistor, R, small letter RE, which at room temperature is 26 millivolts divided by IC. I've covered this a little bit in some of my previous uh, videos talking about uh, bipolar transistor amplifiers that intrinsic emitter resistance appears in series with the effective source impedance. The effective source impedance is whatever we have at RN, which might be the biasing network, it might be the output of whatever stage is driving this. But just like how the input impedance magnifies or multiplies the load resistance by beta, the reverse happens when looking into the emitter. The effective resistor resistance here is divided by beta. So our output impedance is equal to the emitter resistor RE in parallel with our intrinsic emitter resistance RE plus RN divided by beta. Now in most cases RE is a very small value and RN divided by beta oftentimes is going to be much smaller than the bias resistor RE. So many times you can approximate the output impedance of an emitter follower just as RE plus Rn divided by beta. And this is, this is typically a very small value depending on how much current you're driving down through it. Um, so sometimes the Z out or output impedance of emitter follower is just a couple of ohms. Now let's take a look at that. This is where we left off on the basic operation. Remember the emitter resistor is a 1k ohm resistor to ground. I'm going to momentarily touch a 100 ohm resistor in parallel with that 1k resistor. And all you can see is a very small shift in the output. Uh, the peak-to-peak vo -peak voltage stays the same, but because I'm asking the emitter follower to draw more current, my base emitter voltage uh, increases slightly.
So we could see, in this case, going from a 1K ohm load to a 100 ohm load, there's virtually no change in the output. And again, that's the nice thing about an emitter follower. It can drive these low impedance loads with very little detrimental effect. Let's take a look at some practical considerations of the emitter follower. Now we mentioned that the transistor always needs to be biased on. Now in some cases, that can happen just from the natural circuit. I mean, here's our emitter follower right here. Let's say we're using that to buffer the output of, say, a common emitter amplifier. Okay, the DC bias at the output of this amplifier might be sufficient to give me a good bias voltage at the emitter follower. So I can just directly connect them up and therefore the, the previous stage is providing the bias voltage to keep the emitter follower on and then we're just taking the output voltage here, level shifting it down by a dial drop and giving it the ability to drive a much heavier load um, and something that's not going to affect the gain of the circuit by appearing in parallel with our load resistor because what's appearing in parallel with the load resistor is the input impedance to the emitter follower which we've already established it can be quite high. Here's the circuit we use to take a look at the essentially self-biased emitter follower. I've got a common emitter amplifier stage here with a gain set up to be about a factor of uh, inverting gain of 2. We're using a, a set of bias resistors to set up the bias of this common emitter amplifier. So we're AC coupling the output of my function generator into the input. Now we can see that the output of the common emitter amplifier has an impedance of about 10k ohms, which means that I can't connect a, a heavy load here or I'll just completely kill the gain of this amplifier. So we use the emitter follower as a buffer. So that's coming down, that's going to go into that same 1k ohm you know, bias resistor here, and now our output is right here. And we can connect various loads at this point and see that it's not going to affect the gain of the circuit. So we're still using channel 1 to probe the input voltage. We use channel 2 to probe the output of the emitter follower where we're going to connect a couple of different loads. And then we'll use uh, channel 3 to probe the output of the common emitter amplifier to see how it's, it's affected by the load. Okay, so here's our input. Again, it's being AC coupled, so there's no DC bias being shown on here. That's going into the common emitter amplifier. The purple chase, channel 3, is the output of our common emitter stage. And we can see basically 6 or 7 tenths below that is the output of the emitter follower. And the emitter follower right now is just driving that 1k ohm pull down resistor. So now if I connect a 100 ohm load to the output of that emitter follower in parallel with that 1k ohm bias resistor, we'll see a couple things happen. We can see the voltage dropped a little bit. Uh, because of the increased DC load of, of biasing the emitter follower, we can also see the gain changed a little. Well, to think about, now the emitter follower is connected to a, basically a 100 ohm load or something a little bit less than 100 ohms. So even magnified by beta, it might be if, if beta is say 100. So we have 100 times 100, so that's a 10k ohm input impedance now of the emitter follower. That's now appearing in parallel with the 10k output impedance of the common emitter amplifier, so it makes sense that the gain got cut a little bit. But we just changed the load that we were driving by a factor of 10, and we only lost the gain by a factor of about 2, so not bad. Now, of course, we could optimize the circuit to uh, change some impedances around so the effect of that 100 ohm load would be much less, but I wanted to show you something that was a little bit more dramatic. So you can see that even though we changed the output load by more than an order of magnitude, the gain changed only by about a factor of two or less. So in effect, the emitter follower really did buffer um, the output stage of the common emitter amplifier from a very large change in the driven load. Now another interesting practical consideration is when we need to AC couple the input or the output. You typically would need to AC couple the input if you have some kind of a high impedance circuit or source, whether it's an amplifier, a filter, or sensor, or whatever it might be, that doesn't necessarily provide the DC bias necessary to keep the emitter follower on, uh, as we showed in the previous example. So in that case, we'd set up some bias resistors, and we can look at my video on biasing transistors to know how to do that. So we can bias this transistor on and just AC couple the signal in that way. Now a more interesting case is when the output needs to be AC coupled. And that might be a situation, say, like maybe driving a loudspeaker. You might have a low impedance like 8 ohms or 16 ohms. 
but if you could DC connected that, then whatever DC bias you've shown here, you know, and then therefore the bias established at the emitter, that's going to cause a fairly large DC current to flow through the voice coil of that speaker, and you don't want that. So generally you'd use an AC coupling capacitor so that you can establish the DC bias you want uh, with an emitter resistor, and then AC couple the signal only to that load. But the interesting thing to consider here is that you have to worry about what will happen when the that signal swings you know, above and below the quiescent point here. You have to ensure that the emitter follower is always going to be able to source current. So for example, what, as the voltage rises, the emitter follower is going to source current through the emitter as well as through the capacitor into the load. As that voltage begins to fall, then current is going to be returned from the load through the capacitor back into this node. And uh, if, the, if all that current can't go down through the emitter, uh, what will effectively happen is that will shut the emitter follower off, kind of acting like a peak detector. So you have to ensure that you always keep the emitter current positive. Let's take a look at that on the scope. Here's our test circuit example using the function generator with a 2 volt peak to peak input with an offset of 1 volt. So the, that signal is effectively swinging from near ground, effectively ground, up to 2 volts peak and then back down to ground. Still that same 1 kilohertz input frequency. So that's being applied to the input of the emitter follower with my 1K pull down resistor and I'm connecting up a, I was using a 16 ohm speaker but rather than have you listen to a 1 kilohertz tone with the speaker I replaced it with, uh, with effectively 16 ohms of resistance here and we'll actually probe uh, the output and see what's going on. Okay, let's start off without that uh, very low impedance load connected and we can see our 0 to 2 volt peak to peak signal here is uh, only you know, allowing the output to be on during the portion when that voltage is above about 0.6 or 0.7 volts. So I'm going to raise the DC offset of my input signal until we're conducting all the way around. So there's, that's sufficient there. So that's about 1.7 volts DC offset on my 2 volt peak to peak signal. Now we can see our output into the 1K ohm load looks just fine. Now let's connect our AC coupled 16 ohm load. And look at what happened here. We're still following at the peaks, but as soon as we start to go low, where current is going to have to come back through that capacitor into the emitter follower, the emitter follower shuts off and the output basically stays constant. You can see there's a slight slope to this indicating we're discharging that capacitor through the 1K resistor to ground, but it doesn't have enough time to discharge sufficiently before the next cycle comes up. So we're effectively kind of acting like a peak detector. So we need a way of being able to deal with uh, when an AC coupled load needs current being sourced as well as being sunk. So let's take a look at one way to do that. So now one way to do that is to create a push-pull uh, emitter follower output, which is basically a PNP and NPN emitter follower connected together, so that when the signal swings positive, the current can flow through this transistor, through the capacitor to the load, and when the, the voltage swings down, uh, then this transistor can take care of sucking the current back from the load and sinking it back uh, down this way. So we can source current and sink current with this push-pull stage. Let's go take a look at that. Okay, well we have the problem partially solved. Now we can see uh, our NPN emitter follower is providing a following for the positive portion of the signal. And then the PNP emitter follower is providing the sink current to follow the negative portion. But we have this dead zone in the middle, and this is known as crossover distortion. So this crossover distortion that we're, we've introduced is due to the fact that there's effectively a dead zone okay, between uh, this transistor turning on and this transistor turning on. Right? I need plus 0.6 or 0.7 volts this way for that transistor to turn on and I need this to be, the base here to be 6 or 7 tenths of a volt below this point for this transistor to turn on. So in between those two, both these transistors are off and the output essentially stays unchanged. Now there is a way to deal with this by adjusting uh, the bias at both of these transistors so they're both just on the verge of being on or, or on ever so slightly and creating a better push-pull stage that has, doesn't have a dead zone and therefore doesn't have the crossover distortion. But I've done a video on this already. 
If you take a look at my video of the VBE multiplier, it actually talks about an adjustable bias network that you can stick between these two uh, bases to turn these transistors on the right amount. So go take a look at that video, and I'll link it down below, and that will show you how to get rid of the crossover distortion. But it's all about properly biasing emitter followers in a push-pull fashion. Now with what you've learned in today's video, you should see why our output is clamping or cutting off or clipping at minus 5 volts. So even if we eliminated the emitter follower, what voltage would be sitting at this point? It looks like it would be minus 5 volts, right? Because I've got minus 10 volts here, ground here. These both are 1K resistors. So the voltage here is going to be halfway between them or at minus 5. So in order for the voltage at this point to be brought lower than minus 5 volts, we'd have to pull more current through this load resistor. Okay, and since this resistor isn't going to do it here, it would have to be done by the emitter follower, which means the emitter follower would have to sink current. An NPN transistor can't sink current into its emitter, so it shuts off, and that's what's happening right here. I hope this video helped give you a little bit better understanding of the basics of the emitter follower or common collector amplifier. If you liked the video, give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please consider doing so, and ring that little bell to get notified when I post a new video. Thanks again as always for watching, and we'll see you next time.